As, as you said, I was, I was um, asked to speak about ACTA's perspective on the uh, Connected Continent um, proposal of the European Commission today, and, and indeed, as you said, it is very timely um, to discuss the digital single market now, um, when there are um, quite some interesting developments. Um, first of all, uh, in the legislative process, we already know the position of the European Parliament, so the European Parliament has adopted already um, its first reading, um, and it is a rather clear view, I would say, that the European Parliament has taken. Um, the Council is looking at the proposal right now, so they are really um, trying to, to, to find um, um, common ground on it. Um, and at the same time, as we are um, on the doorstep of having an, a new European Commission, um, the political guidelines of President Elect Juncker, um, as well as the mission letters that he has sent um, to the Vice President Digital Single Market, um, as well as to the Commissioner uh, Digital Economy and Society, very clearly prioritize the completion of the Digital Single Market and they call for ambitious legislative steps um, in this regard. Um, now, um, with regard to the legislative process and how we come about um, a well-founded legislative proposal, um, ACTA is a very firm believer in transparency and in due process. And we believe that any comprehensive and ambitious legislative package must be based, first of all, on a robust and very clear analysis of the problems to be addressed. And in this case, we think that the, the genuine questions to be asked are really, what are the genuine barriers to the single market? Are these regulatory or legal obstacles at all? And, and if they are indeed found to be legal or regulatory obstacles, then can these obstacles best be addressed by new legislation or perhaps by a more vigorous implementation and enforcement of already existing EU rules? So I think that is kind of the first issue which I would call some, some, something like the, the problem analysis and identification. Then I think what we also need is a well-founded and clear assessment of the likely impact of the proposed measures on the economy as a whole, on end users, be they consumers or businesses, um, as well as the industry. And last but not least, very importantly, a proper public consultation and public debate should precede um, the adoption of any legislative proposal. Now, if um, we start perhaps looking at uh, the substance of the single market um, and maybe the premises um, and the preceding discussion, um, what were these premises and, um, and what was the discussion about? Some argued um, in the course of this discussion, and we see a lot of public statements, we have seen a lot of public statements in, in, regard, in this regard, is Number one, that the EU is seriously lagging behind other parts of the world. Um, then it was also argued by some that there are too many operators in Europe compared to some other markets, which is withholding the development of a single European uh, telecoms market. Thirdly, that the telecom sector is in a crisis and fourthly, that there is a robust lack of investments which must be addressed. Now, if we look at these premises, um, I think one by one, just quite briefly, um, the first one is that the EU is lagging um, seriously behind other parts of the world. Um, I think that um, if we carry out um, a thorough analysis, and indeed the European Parliament has asked some independent consultants to carry out a, a quite thorough analysis um, on these premises, um, I think it is fair to argue that uh, the European Union, if you can call it a homogeneous, to the extent you can call it a homogeneous area, um, is faring actually quite well compared to its global peers. Um, 
there are some areas in which some parts of the world are ahead. So, for example, um, it seems quite clear that uh, the United States has a much more extensive coverage of 4G LTE uh, networks than, than Europe does. Um, but then if you look at um, the reasons, or you look behind the reasons, um, it is really that in the United States, uh, the respective uh, spectrum band had been allocated um, and assigned, uh, I think, in 2007, so much, much earlier than the first such spectrum assignment took place um, in Europe. And then if you look at the reaction of the market in Europe to such spectrum assignments, you could see that, for example, in Sweden, uh, from the spectrum assignment, um, it took about two years for the operators to achieve something like 96% coverage. So actually, um, I think it is much more kind of a, a time lag uh, rather than um, rather than th rather than an issue that can be easily addressed by new legislation. Especially in light of the fact that we have. Um, a legally binding measure, the radio spectrum policy program, um, which actually sets out a deadline for member states um, to assign that specific um, spectrum band, which, which has not been assigned yet in, in several countries. Um, so if anything, this is more of an implementation issue rather than something to which we should, uh, in my view, react with um, kind of uh, very urgent new legislative measures. Um, and if you look at the the, the fixed, um, sorry, with regard to mobile, maybe just one more comparison, which which is uh, often overlooked, is that although Europe doesn't have nearly as extensive coverage in with um, regard to 4G LTE um, as, for example, uh, the uh, US, if you look at the um, measurements on the speeds, the mobile broadband speeds that the consumers are actually getting on existing technologies, we are not really behind. So even though we have, um, I would say, an older generation of networks, the speeds that the customer actually gets uh, are not worse. Um, when you look at um, fixed broadband, um, then also there are some quite clear measurements. Um, there are some reports um, which have been actually commissioned by the um, European Commission, by SEMNOS, which measured um, broadband uh, speeds on both sides of the um, Atlantic. Um, and actually, the figures of, of the European Commission show that European consumers get significantly higher fixed broadband speeds um, on every single fixed technology, uh, then it's um, then, for example, um, uh, consumers in the U.S. Um, so um, I think that yet you can argue, of course, that there is more um, fiber, for example, in Japan than there is in Europe. But I think what I'm trying to say is that um, overall, if you look at many factors to compare then it doesn't really uh, occur to us. And I think that was also kind of the view that um, the regulators group Barrack has voiced, that the situation is as gloomy as has been, um, uh, I think, staged by, by, um, by, by some groups. Um, then the other issue, there, there are too many operators in Europe compared to some other markets. Now, certainly there are more operators um, thanks to competition in a, a quite um, vibrant market in Europe than, for example, in, in China. Um, but um, um, I think, um, for example, in the United States, although we have some very large operators, um, there are also quite numerous um, smaller regional and local players. So it is not uh, at all that far, I think, from, um, uh, from, from the European number um, than, um, as, as some would argue. Um, now that the telecom sector is um, in a crisis, um, I think um, we have heard quite a few times the argument that the revenues um, in the sector are declining. Now that is certainly correct for some operators, it is not correct for others. 
Um, but yes, there are operators for whom um, wh whose revenues are indeed declining. Uh, but I think the, the big question to ask is that, is that something that can be easily addressed by a legislative package or, or, by, or by regulation? Or is that more of um, a commercial problem uh, or is that more of a problem that could be addressed by other types of measures um, which could uh, boost demand? I would also argue that actually competition, very vibrant competition and innovation and affordability delivered by competition are the key factors which actually boost the demand. I think that is what um, history of broadband in Europe tells us. Um, I think uh, quite a few years ago uh, people were arguing that, well, who would, who would use one or two megabits per second? That's just such a huge bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Um, and as um, unbundling happened, um, and as uh, the competitors came to the market, and they have started offering not uh, standalone internet, but triple play packages mm -hmm. at really quite affordable prices, then the consumers became more interested. And actually, if you look at um, the take-up figures of that period, you can see that when competition was kicked off by unbundling, then uh, broadband take-up has started to skyrocket um, in, in Europe. Um, so actually, I think um, the, the fact that there, there are declining revenues um, in a sector doesn't necessarily mean that that is something that regulation can easily solve. And fourthly, I mentioned um, the argument that there is a robust lack of investment. Uh, now, that is not to say, I, I wouldn't argue that we shouldn't think about fostering investments. Indeed, that is, I think, a very important uh, part of, um, of even, even the whole uh, regulatory framework uh, to incentivize efficient investments. Um, but if we look at, for example, uh, the year-on-year -year, uh, deployment of new um, fiber or partly fiber, partly copper networks, um, uh, for example, I am thinking of a study that was uh, published by the European Commission, I think towards the end of um, last year, it was by Point Topic, who, who looked at basically a network mapping in the year-on-year -year development, we can see that there is quite a lot of deployment happening in Europe and there is a quite significant increase in the number of fiber lines installed. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there is also uh, quite an, an ambitious uh, plan here in Ireland um, to deploy more advanced fixed technologies. Um, so, um, at, at the same time, as I've already mentioned, um, in mobile broadband, we could see that wherever the spectrum was made available, there was a very quick deployment of the latest 4G technology. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there is ongoing investment um, in Europe. Uh, there is ongoing investment both by incumbent operators and also very importantly by alternative operators. Um, um, I think in alternative operators are a very important part uh, of the investment uh, uh, scene today. Um, they have started investing um, in local loop unbundling, uh, but then many of them went on and they are now investing quite actively um, in fiber, uh, either fiber to the home or um, a fiber uh, to the cabinet. Um, and in some countries, the alternative operators are still the leading investors um, when it comes to fiber technologies. Um, so I would argue that these claims that have been made as the kind of the premises of the discussion about the single market would uh, misguide really the discussion. And the discussion should focus on identifying the genuine obstacles to the single market and solve the problems that can be genuinely solved by legislation or regulatory action in the spirit of the treaties, which is to enable free movement across borders and to ensure unrestricted um, competition. If we look at um, some of the uh, parts of the proposals, um, the proposal on, on the connected continent, 
Uh, one part of um, the proposal was um, addressing um, a single authorization regime. So that is that um, if you would like to start your activities as a telecoms operator in any given European market, then it would be extremely easy because basically you would only have to notify um, the national regulator that you plan to do so. And then with that you can just start your activities. Um, I think um, we have seen that the practices, so really the implementation of this rule on the ground um, has some divergences. Um, so um, it is necessary to address probably this issue, um, but um, maybe there can be a quite simple solution. Um, and indeed, we welcome the European Parliament's uh, proposal in this regard that it should be really the regulators group, BEREC, who should sort out this issue, which is much more of an implementation issue uh, rather than something that needs a legislative response. Um, the other very important part of the proposal for, uh, for the ECTA members was the part about uh, the wholesale access products. Um, the proposal uh, sought to um, harmonize um, some aspects of, of wholesale access products um, and we thought that that could, the way in which it was proposed, we thought that that could potentially have a detrimental effect on the current competition, competition model of the EMU, EU framework. Uh, and we think that certainly the current competition mo model of the EU framework is something that has brought probably the biggest benefits uh, to European consumers, European citizens, in a global comparison. Uh, and ultimately, it is really the user who should be the center, at the center of the action of the EU institutions. The statistics uh, of some international organizations, it's not active statistics, um, so statistics that we have looked at from the ITU, from the OECD, uh, and also the European Commission uh, itself clearly show that European consumers get higher broadband speed, so that's what is actually being delivered to the end user. They have more choice, um, they can choose from more innovative offers and more affordable prices than their global peers. As a consequence to this, um, in Europe there is a higher take-up, there is a higher usage of broadband than, for example, in the US, Japan or China. And if our ultimate objective is to have a knowledge-based society, if our ultimate objective is um, to actually ensure that there is uh, a growth generating factor, that there are more jobs, that it has an impact on employment, it has an impact on education, then I think probably the single most important factor there is actually the take-up because we can have all the networks we want to have in the ground, but if people are not using them, then they are actually quite useless. So I think that looking at take-up and under what conditions are the consumers most likely to actually start using broadband where they are not using it, um, is something that should be very carefully looked at um, uh, in, in any uh, future uh, legislative package as well. Um, so, therefore, um, I think we very much believe that the, this competition law principle based uh, and also a very future proof approach that we have in the current framework should be maintained um, in the long term. It is very clear that it is uh, technology neutral, uh, that it is really based on sound economic principles that can be applied today and tomorrow. Um, this is something that we should preserve and build on. Um, it is very clear that last mile power cannot be a lever for gaining unfair competitive advantage. And that is true today and that will be true tomorrow. Um, we think that another very important uh, factor with regard to access regulation and the 
pro-competitive uh, model of the, uh, of the EU is um, the question of investments. Um, you probably heard, I think, the uh, um, other side arguing that there would be more investments if regulation, if excess regulation was removed. Um, actually, if we look at um, the study, that independent study that the European Parliament um, had carried out, um, that study found that um, excess regulation doesn't seem to have uh, a very significant impact on the investment decisions of incumbent operators. Uh, so if you look at, um, uh, I think, European countries and you look at um, the stage of deployment of fiber networks, you look at the <coughs> regulatory regime, um, they, the study found that it is very difficult to actually find a, um, a straightforward correlation between the existence of excess regulation and the levels of investment by the incumbent operator. However, what is, I think, very important to know that if our objective is to maximize investment so that it is not only the incumbent operators who invest, but it is also the alternative, the challenger operators mm -hmm. who invest, then regulation, access regulation, has a very key role to play. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the letter of investment principle, I think, is something that has proven uh, to work in practice, and we see several alternative operators across Europe who have climbed the ladder of investment and who are running a healthy business. Um, alternative operators started investing first in local loop unbundling, so rolling out their network up to the um, local exchange, um, and they're renting the last mile uh, from the incumbent operator. Uh, but now we also see some alternative operators, uh, uh, for example, um, in Italy, who are going further than that, uh, who are rolling out fiber to the street cabinet and rent only a, a very small last part of the incumbent operator's network. And that is um, a quite important step um, in investments. Uh, uh, let alone that there are also investment uh, uh, made by alternative operators in fiber to the home. Uh, but for example, if you look at the Spanish market, the key enabler of making those investments uh, um, in fiber to the home is having access to the ducts um, of the incumbent operator. So having um, physical access products um, and this focus on physical access products in the European regime has been the key enabler of investments made by alternative operators. And I think it is extremely important that if we go forward, we really think of um, a regulatory environment that incentivizes investments by all and enables investments by all players not only by incumbent operators or indeed by alternatives. Um, another area which I think is, uh, has interestingly come up in the connected um, continent context um, and which has been taken um, um, uh, forward a bit um, by the European Commission um, and where I think that the creation of the single market uh, could probably have the, the most important economic effect is uh, the provision of more competitive communication solutions to businesses um, and public administrations, um, in particular um, uh, multinational businesses. Uh, we think that there is genuinely uh, an urgent need for more European action and more harmonization or coordination um, in this area in order to help European businesses to become more effective and productive. Uh, boosting the efficiency of companies in all sectors can have a singular great effect on growth and jobs. And indeed, um, the studies which preceded uh, this Connected Continent proposal, um, I think there was a study entitled uh, the uh, the cost of non-Europe, the cost of non-Europe, um, which um, which calculated a, a very large sum, I think 100 and, and 110 billion euros that could be generated uh, by having more Europe uh, rather than less Europe. A large part of that was actually um, 
the creation of more competition in the provision of communication services to businesses. And this is an area uh, which has not been specifically addressed, uh, I think, uh, by the European regulatory regime. We have been very much uh, focusing on, on the consumer uh, as the key end user, but businesses are also end users of communication services and their efficiency and productivity depends quite a lot on the competitiveness uh, of, of, their, um, of their communications businesses. Um, so I think this is the key area where the European Commission came up with a proposal to harmonize wholesale access products which are of the grade of business usage, so business grade wholesale access products. Um, that is an area where I would certainly agree that uh, more action would be needed um, and sooner rather than later. Um, in terms of the um, institutional setup, the current institutional setup, the proposal also contained um, some elements with regard to Barrett, the body of European regulators. Um, and um, it also uh, looked into the possibility of, of uh, more powers to the, to the European Commission. Um, we actually think that uh, the current division of powers has worked really quite well. I think there is a good balance. Uh, we, we, we don't really see a deficiency um, in that. Uh, and we also think that it is necessary to have a good checks and balances between the different institutions. Um, so we actually support the European uh, Parliament's um, take on this issue. Um, maybe just one, um, um, I think, short remark on, on, on spectrum policy. Spectrum policy is also one area in which uh, the uh, new commission's political guidelines and uh, the mission letters foresee more action. Um, I think that probably all operators would agree that um, it would be extremely useful to have uh, a more coordinated approach in which operators are able to plan ahead and see better when auctions would, for example, take place. So I think that um, certainly a, a planning ahead certainty, some more coordination in this area would be much welcome. Um, there is an issue, I think, which has uh, come up in a lot of discussions, therefore I guess I cannot avoid speaking about it, which is, um, which is, in, which is international roaming. Um, ACTA is supportive of the objective to abolish excessively high roaming charges uh, for end users and, and to create a very positive roaming experience for consumers traveling across borders. Um, I think that uh, what is important with regard to roaming, however, is that the industry has legal certainty and predictability with regard to the applicable rules and the investments that are necessary uh, to be made in order to comply with those rules. And at the moment, I think we feel that um, different, different measures and proposals on the table are pulling um, in different directions. Um, and, and there is currently um, a roaming regulation in force, um, which also has a deadline um, in it, um, the, the deadline that has already passed with regard to the coupling uh, of roaming services. Um, yet we are discussing, um, and that is also very clear, I think, um, in the political statements with regard to the objectives of the new commission, that there should be no roaming surcharges faced by consumers. Um, but if then basically the future is the phasing out of roaming charges, then it doesn't make very much sense for industry to, um, to invest in a solution which, is, which has been designed to create more competition and competitive offerings in the roaming prices. <coughs> um, so I think here the plea um, of probably the whole industry would be that please only require sensible investments uh, by legislation um, and make sure that the industry is able to 
plan ahead um, and uh, has legal certainty with regard to what it has to do. Um, I think that these are the key thoughts about um, the proposal itself. I think we need to see um, the further developments in the Council and um, what, what will come next, whether or not there will be um, adoption and when and what will be adopted uh, also, um, as well as it is interesting to note that um, uh, the, um, the political guidelines of President-elect Juncker foresee adding more ambition to the ongoing reform of the telecoms rules, um, and I think it will be interesting to see what, what that actually means. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.